Hey folks, welcome back to the channel. Eric the Old Jarhead here. And did you know that there are about 180,000 people living completely off-grid in the U.S. today? At least that's the number I saw. I actually figured it would be in the millions, but well, I don't know. Not sure where they get their information. Many people dream of living off the grid, but they kind of struggle with how to get enough power to, you know, power up everything they want to live with. But I want to say that the first thing that you've got to do if you're thinking about living off grid is realize that you're probably not going to have the same kind or amount of power that you have living in a big city or in town or even in the suburbs or heck for that matter rurally as long as you're connected to the grid. Connected to the grid is like having a, a tap that just never runs out of water that you could flow as much water as you want out of it and you're never going to drain it down. That's what living on the grid is like. And by living off the grid, I mean off the power grid because let's face it, most people that live off the grid today have at least internet and cell phones. So we're just talking about power. So how do you bridge that gap from having that, you know, inexhaustible tap of power hooked up to your house and suddenly disconnecting the cord and saying, no more, I'm gonna live off grid. Well, the first thing I would tell you is you gotta learn to live with less. And I know that that's kind of cliche. Everybody probably says that, right? But it really is true. Somebody the other day was telling another viewer of my channel in the comments that he should look at an induction cook surface for making coffee and stuff like that. And, and my first thought was, or propane. And then somebody else mentioned using a diesel heater to heat up your cabin. And I thought, or wood. Because when you live off grid, you know that power's limited. And even if you build a fairly big system for your needs, well, you tend to try to reserve that for those cloudy days when no sun's charging up your batteries and you really got to try to make it three or four or five days without any real good solar production. So you learn to do things like use a wood stove to heat your cabin, even heat up water on the wood stove. And in fact, one of my neighbors has a hot water tank set up so that in the winter, all of their hot water is produced by their wood stove. He runs copper pipe around the chimney, runs that to a, a regular hot water heater, sets some valves and pressure relief and stuff like that, and it keeps his hot water heater at 120 degrees, no problem, all winter long. But that's because he runs off the wood stove to heat his house. So it's running all winter long, might as well use it to heat your water. Now in my case, because I have a small cabin and I don't live there full time, I use a two gallon pot on top of the wood stove to heat up hot water in the winter time. And if I'm not living there full time, I don't have to have running hot water. I can survive just fine without it. Now, when I did live at the cabin full time and my pipes weren't frozen and I didn't blow up my hot water heater, <laughs> that's a whole nother story. But then I have a heated back room where my water comes in and that's the only part of my entire cabin that has a permanently running propane heater. And I have a big 500 gallon propane tank to keep that room warm. Now, if the situation got to where I just couldn't use that anymore because propane was too expensive, I could actually pipe heat from the main cabin into that room using insulated duct runs under the cabin and insulate those doubly. And I could put a fan in there and pump warm air back into that back room and keep it warm, no problem. So there's always ways to get around things. And that's one of the things about living off grid that you kind of learn to do, figure out how to make things work without using a lot of power. But let's talk about power because that's why you're watching, right? You want to know how to power at least your cabin. Now I'm going to stipulate like I do many times, I'm not talking about cabins that are 6,000 square feet, monstrous log homes in, you know, Montana. The principle is the same, but I don't have experience building systems that big. I just have a small cabin, so I don't need to worry about that kind of power. I don't need a hundred kilowatts of battery power to run my cabin. So the basics of building an off-grid power system are always centered around the batteries. And I've said this in previous videos, don't think of it as solar power. Think of it as battery power, because that's where everything happens. That's the heart of your entire system. Without batteries, forget it. You gotta have batteries. And you have to figure out 
how much battery you need. And there are lots of calculators online that you can go to where you can put in every single device that you have, figure out how many watts they use and how many times you're gonna use them per day. And in fact, I'll drop a link down below to the spreadsheet I used for my cabin. And you just populate all the fields and it'll tell you how much battery bank you need in order to run for the amount of days that you wanna be able to run without solar power. And that's typically between three and five days, with five days usually being the target. And that's called five days of autonomy or three to five days of autonomy, which means if your solar panels just ain't producing because they're covered in snow and it's cloudy and it's snowing and it's dark and it's miserable out, how long can those batteries last? You want them to be able to last at least long enough for you to go out and brush off the panels and the sun to come out, right? So three to five days is generally the target with most folks trying to lean towards that five day window. Once you have your battery bank sized, then at a minimum, you need at least enough solar to charge up probably half of that battery bank in just a couple hours. Once you have your solar array figured out, the next thing that you need to do is get a charge controller that can take the power coming in from those solar panels and convert it to the correct charging voltage and ramp because depending on the type of battery, it's you don't just send full voltage to the battery at all times. You need a charge controller that can adjust that voltage. It might start out a little bit higher and eventually drop down to do what's called float charging. Float charging is basically like a trickle charger. It's just there to keep the batteries topped up. Once you've got those charge controllers, there's a couple things you have to consider. One is fusing between the panels and that's really just if your panels are in series, meaning that the positives are connected to negatives and negative to positive and so on down the line so that it increases the voltage but keeps the amperage the same, it's best to fuse between those panels. The next thing you need is a combiner box. Now, a combiner box isn't necessarily needed if you're only running one array in series because it wouldn't do much for you, you're not combining anything. But if you're taking a, a bunch of panels like I have on the roof, I've got six panels on the roof, and I have three sets of two in series, and all three of those sets of panels go down to that combiner box, and each set of panels has its own breaker. And those breakers then can be turned off if I need to work on something, or they could trip. But it wouldn't take out all six panels, it would only take out the one that trips. With all of those three run into those breakers, when the breakers are on, it then parallels those three arrays so that all of that power is now going to the charge controller. Then from the charge controller, you're also going to need a breaker going into your main disconnect box. And of course, you need a main disconnect box. Now the main disconnect box is kind of like the, the heart of all of the electrical wiring for your power. It's where you're going to have breakers for your charge controllers. So the solar panels are gonna have breakers before they get to the charge controller, then the charge controller is gonna have a breaker before it gets to the batteries. And that's gonna go into that disconnect box and there will be a main disconnect switch. In my case, I have a 250 amp main disconnect switch that shuts the batteries and the inverter off. And it disconnects all power from going to or from the batteries. That's an important item to have in your off-grid power. A lot of guys don't do it, but I always suggest that you put one in. It's really important, especially when it comes time to work on things. It's really easy just to drop that main disconnect and pull out an inverter because you don't have to worry about it because you disconnected it from the batteries. Now, I just mentioned inverter. Well, you got to have one of those. The inverter is what takes the battery DC power and converts that to 120 volt AC power, at least in North America. Over in Europe, it would be, I think, 240 volts, but we run 120 volts here in North America. My inverter is also a charger, so it's commonly called an inverter charger. You don't have to have an inverter charger, but I do suggest that you have a charger. And a generator is kind of really important because there's going to be times where you're just not getting solar production and your batteries are getting low and you need some way to get them charged back up before the sun comes out because maybe it ain't coming out for another week. Okay, so we've got solar panels, charge controllers, we've got an inverter and or inverter charger or charger. We've got a generator, we got all the breakers and all that good stuff. Is there anything else we need? Well, if you wanna run 12 volt accessories off of your battery bank and you have a 24 or 48 volt battery bank, then you will need a step down converter from either 24 or 48 volts down to 12. 
that's pretty much all you really need, especially with today, because most systems have Bluetooth apps that you could see what your system's doing on your phone. But you can get battery monitors. I like those. I have one on my system as well. They're really nice to have. But that's really all you have to have to have an off-grid cabin. Anyway, folks, I hope that helps somebody out. Listen, y'all have a great day. I'm going to drop another video right here for you to check out. Thanks for watching, folks. The old jar head out.